I should print my notes out, but my uh, printer's actually broken at the moment, so I have to rely on my fantastic scribing methods and writing with my hands. But welcome, good morning, and hello to anyone online as well. Good day. <laughs> uh, if you want to, uh, please turn. We're going to be attempting uh, to set ourselves a goal of going through an entire book of the Bible today, but I'll keep track of time, so don't stress too much about it. Uh, if, I, if, I, if it's going to take too long, I'll happily split it over. But uh, if you want to turn to the book of Jude, uh, we're going to turn to the book of Jude, so that's all the way back at near the end of the Bible. Uh, it's a small book, uh, which can often get missed. It's only 25 verses. Uh, but we're going to attempt to uh, study the importance that is in this book uh, in the short and uh, deliberate and pertinent book for these times uh, that we live in. So uh, we begin with this book of Jude and it was written by a, a, a person called Jude or if you want to know, that's the short uh, of his name, but his name is actually Judas. Uh, and it says in the verse 1, it says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. So he is writing this to uh, a group of Christians. Uh, but first off, let's ask ourselves the question, who is this Jude? Uh, some people who would know their uh, history uh, might already know the answer, but I'm going to show you where it is in the Bible uh, so that you can always refer back to it. But if you turn to Matthew chapter 13 and keep your finger in Jude because we'll be going back and forth to there. Uh, but Matthew chapter 13 and verse 55, we read about this uh, Jude. So in Matthew 13 and verse 55, it says, uh, is this not, and this is where Jesus is working uh, within and performing miracles uh, with the full net uh, being cast. And so this is where it comes into and Jesus is in his own country. And we'll start at verse 53 for context. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables of teaching, uh, he departed thence and when he was come into his own country, so he's come back to where his uh, family is, uh, he taught them in their synagogue inasmuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man, this wisdom, and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Uh, is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas. And so this is the first mention of Jesus' four brothers. Uh, and you can see here that Jesus, even though uh, they could see that he had much wisdom and much uh, uh, and wisdom and the mighty works that he was trying to do that uh, unfortunately his family and in his country or in the part where he grew up uh, they did not see him as God and even his own brothers uh, they did not believe uh, they did not follow him per se during his life uh, we can turn for another account of it in uh, Mark 6 because the gospels are a blessing in giving us different uh, little add-ons but in verse 6 uh, chapter 6 of uh, Mark in verse 3 it says uh, again, they say, is this not the carpenter's son, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? And not, are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. So they were offended at Jesus, this person that they grew up, that they ran around in, like in the courtyard playing with. Uh, but they suddenly had saw the wisdom that was there from Jesus and that he was only the lowly carpenter's son. Uh, so we have Judah here, or Jude, uh, and this is his brother. And I'll turn there to save you because we'll still be doing lots of turning. But in Acts, uh, if you're writing down in Acts 1, uh, verse 14, uh, it really captures here. It says, uh, so through the life of Jesus, his brothers really didn't uh, do anything in the sense of following him. Uh, they just saw him as their older brother who could do no wrong. It's probably pretty annoying. I always think of being the brother of Jesus, like be pretty hard growing up with uh, Mary and Joseph knowing that he couldn't sin. Uh, but in verse, in verse 14, it says here, and this is after Jesus has died and resurrected, it said uh, in verse 14 of chapter 1 of Acts, it says, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And so his uh, brethren, so his brothers, uh, his family uh, became, after seeing him resurrected because they knew he had died, uh, suddenly realized that he was who he said he was. Uh, and they became uh, firm uh, preachers and ministers for him uh, and mighty in the work to go and share how Jesus was Christ. And so we have Jude, the brother of uh, 
He doesn't say that he's the brother of Jesus Christ because uh, he humbles himself and he just sneaks it in there like saying that he's the brother of James rather. Uh, he doesn't say, he knows that he's not the full brother of Jesus Christ, but he says he's the servant of Jesus Christ, recognising that he, has, uh, he is Lord and he's submitted unto him. But he shows that which Jude he is uh, to the uh, people that he's writing to. Uh, in verse 3, we come to the reason why Jude is, uh, why, the reason why Jude is writing this letter. And so it goes uh, from verse 3, it says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So this is where Jude, he had uh, previously thought to lay out to write about the common salvation, uh, to make it quite, uh, write quite a lengthy letter. Uh, but for the reason that we're about to read, uh, he had to uh, quickly change and to quickly uh, exhort the congregation to contend for the faith. Uh, contend mean to struggle for, to make sure that you're not giving up the ground. Uh, and in verse 4, as we continue, it says, we find out the reason why he had to do this quickly. Uh, it says, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. It's quite interesting what Dave uh, talked about with uh, that Zacchaeus's acts were not uh, weren't the things that saved him, but it was a reaction to him being saved. And so we have almost the opposite here, where we have men who are saying that they are saved, uh, but their acts are not lining up to it. They are turning from the grace of the Lord and almost saying in a way that what we do on this earth doesn't matter, therefore I can do what I want. And that's where it talks about lasciviousness, that's uh, licentiousness. It's, it's, the, it's a really bad uh, description for just the wickedness and depravity that can happen. Uh, there's, many, there's many parts where it talks about this, uh, where uh, whenever it talks about men given over to sinful pleasures, uh, men given over to, uh, or just humanity given over and not living by any standard of their life, uh, it, it comes back to this word. So they're purely living by their sinful desires. And so we had these men who had crept in and were now trying to teach and have uh, stations of power and authority uh, and were using it to try and lead the people away into sin. Uh, they were living their lives for greed, uh, for following whatever lusts that they had in their life and it didn't matter. So this was the reason why Jude has uh, come in and he's teaching or he's written this letter uh, to try and address this and to try and warn the church of these people that are coming in. He doesn't name them. Uh, he just, he knows that they'll know who they're talking, who he's talking about. But I think it's quite interesting that uh, false teachers was something that was warned long ago. And, we, and Jude reminds this uh, to the people that he's writing to uh, so it's almost pertinent that he doesn't name, so that it's not just, they wouldn't think that was just for those specific people, but that it applies to anyone coming in who's not living a life uh, worthy of the Lord that matches up to what they're saying or what they should be preaching. In verse 5, so now we come to the part where Jude is going to be giving some examples. Uh, we've had these, these men who are preaching falsehood, who are living a life that is not glorifying to God, uh, and living a life that is just purely driven by their own desires uh, into the most disgusting depravity that they can. Uh, in verse 5 it says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. So the people that Jude's writing to, it most likely is going to be uh, a Jewish uh, congregation, because what he starts to call on throughout the book is all the old Jewish traditions. So unlike Paul, where he would talk in, talk, uh, maybe quote some Cretan uh, poets and other things, uh, we find Jude using some uh, traditional, we'll say literature and uh, stories that would have been told to the culture to get his point across. Uh, in some of them, it, it's referring straight back to the Old Testament, but we'll see some in the future. Uh, in further down where he's referring to uh, traditional books that aren't in the Bible, but 
uh, that the people would know about so that he could get straight to the point. Uh, when it comes here, so we have uh, saved the, the people that were saved out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believed them not. So you can find this account in Numbers 14, you can write it down, uh, but you can think about uh, not just when they were uh, initially saved from Egypt, uh, and they'd been saved from Pharaoh's army, where they suddenly started to worship a golden calf, they had suddenly been saved and they forgot what they were saved to, to follow God. And they started to just party and be making such an uproar that it sounded like war to uh, Joshua and Moses. And so when it comes to that, uh, you, you can think on how uh, they, they sunk into deep sin and depravity of partying and uh, whatever other desires that they were doing at the time, uh, worshipping a false god. They turned away from God almost instantly after the salvation. And then if you want to take it even further where they were taken all the way to the promised land and Joshua and Caleb went in and they were the only ones who gave the good report of saying, yes, the Lord, we can take this land. The Lord has promised us. And the rest of the congregation said, no. We can't, they're giants, we're grasshoppers. They had unbelief. And they murmured and they believed not what was told to them. Even though they, the Lord had shown them time and time again and they'd been uh, saved from Egypt, saved from, uh, they had seen the judgment uh, pass right then and there to wickedness, brought all this way. They knew, they didn't see obviously or believe what the Lord had already done in putting the fear of God into the nations that were there. Uh, but when it came to there, they, they still said, no, God's not, God's not strong enough, big enough to use us to beat them. No, we can't do it, God. And so God punished them. Uh, he wiped out all of them, saved Joshua and Caleb of that generation. Uh, the rest of them would wander the wilderness until they died. Uh, he destroyed them. He destroyed the people that he had saved because they had believed not. And so Jude's really drawing on, showing that... Uh, God is not going to hold back judgment. So as we keep reading, uh, so he's saying his people, Israel, uh, his chosen people, he did not withhold punishment from them when they slipped away from him. Then it comes into verse 6 where it says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, or their first estate meaning uh, arche, which is the proper station that they were called for, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Now we get to the point where we've had uh, the Lord's chosen people uh, getting punished for their uh, rejection of God, uh, rebelling against God's authority. Uh, then we have uh, the angels. Even the angels couldn't escape the judgment from when they rebelled against God, the third that went with Satan, with Lucifer. This third that rebelled against God, they could not escape the judgment that was uh, coming for them. And then we come to verse 7 where it says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities unto them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. That vengeance, that word for it, uh, is dikai, which is sentence of con uh, condemnation. So vengeance isn't really, it's not like you did this, I'm going to get you like, to make it even. It's, it's really the Lord passing a righteous judgment uh, on the sin that was here. And this is where we can read what these false men that had crept in have what they were doing. Uh, so they were following after the Sodom and Gomorrah. So now we have the example where uh, first we have God's chosen people couldn't escape judgment. The angels that the Lord created uh, couldn't escape judgment. And now anyone uh, couldn't escape the judgment for the sin that they were committing. And it says here in verse 8 where he goes on to describe... Uh, he uses those three examples from the Old Testament to describe these teachers now. In verse 8 it says, Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion and speak evil of dignities or speak evil of authorities. So we have these men who, uh, they're not simply just being in there maybe grumbling, they are actually going uh, against the Lord, they're living a life uh, that is uh, not pleasing to the Lord, not according to God's standard. But not only that, they're trying to teach the people that that's okay. And so that the Lord is saying here, and Jude is, the Lord is saying through Jude here that there is a judgment coming for them, uh, that they are defiling and they are in no way going to escape it. 
Then we get into verse 9. Uh, where it says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring any, uh, any against him a railing accusa- uh, accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But the Lord rebuke thee. And it said, But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things, they corrupt themselves. When it comes here... Uh, the, the story that Jude's referring to here is from a book called uh, The Assumption of Moses. Uh, it's not, it was one that was held in Jewish tradition, uh, but it's not one that uh, is, is in the Bible because it's not God's holy word. Uh, but he's referring to this story to show that uh, when it comes to even the power of Michael the archangel, that if he was to go against the devil... And having an argument that he wouldn't say, he wouldn't rely on his own power, but that ultimately it would be the Lord. The Lord would rebuke him. The Lord would pass the judgment. The Lord would be the one to uh, hand out the punishment. And so then it flows on uh, to these men where the Lord is starting to show and talk about them. And it says, but these speak evil of those things which they know not. So these men are not speaking about the true word of God. Uh, They're just talking from their own experience. They haven't gone through and studied and uh, to show themselves approved unto God. They haven't gone and put uh, scripture against scripture. Uh, But what they've been doing, and it says in that next part, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, they're only instinctual. Uh, They're only going about teaching what they think is right or what makes them happy. Uh, It's a very very interesting uh, ethic stand to just follow your life for passion. And so that's what these teachers are doing and they're in the way that they're doing, they're corrupting uh, the church or the congregation that the Lord is speaking to here. We then come to verse 11 where the Lord starts to talk on uh, how he's going to deal with these people uh, and and, and gives three more examples of uh, their character uh, within themselves. So first off, we had like their conduct where uh, they're rebelling, they're rebelling uh, in the same way that, that Israel did, the angels did, and Sodom and Gomorrah. But now we come to the character where in verse 11 it says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. Now, Talia, I'm going to ask you a question. You ready? What did Cain do in the Bible? He killed his brother. What did he do before that? He gave God an offering. Do you remember what it was? Yes, excellent. Good job. I don't have a gold star, but you give a good thumbs up. Good job. Uh, that's right. So Cain, Cain killed his brother. Uh, but what ultimately led to it was when he had offered his sacrifice of vegetables that he had worked with his own hands, and you can read this in Genesis 4, uh, where he offered his offering to the Lord, uh, it wasn't pleasing to him. And Abel's was more... Uh, pleasing to him because it was a lamb and it it had shed blood which obviously we know that it was to show how Jesus would shed his blood Uh, and Cain got angry at it and the Lord saw and he said to him why are you wroth you know like you know what to do Uh, just just do that next time it's fine and I'll accept your offering just do it next time otherwise if you stay angry sin's going to be at the door to paraphrase it and unfortunately Cain didn't turn from that anger And it led him to kill his brother. So we have here uh, where the Lord is talking of the anger of Cain uh, and how he is being led by purely his emotions and the instincts of just being unbridled rage to the point of killing his uh, brother. And then we have the next one and it says, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. So not only are these men angry and being led by their emotions, but now we have that they're like Balaam. And Balaam was a... Uh, and you can read this story later if you want to, but that's in Numbers 22 uh, to 25. Uh, and Balaam, probably most famous for having the talking donkey, uh, where he's, he's riding it and he's suddenly, you know, the angel of the Lord is there in front ready to smite this uh, wicked man who was trying to curse Israel. And the donkey saw the angel and would stop. And then Balaam just went to flogging it to it could do no more. And the angel of the Lord actually opened his mouth and the donkey said, why are you hitting me? What have I done, master? 
And I love how Balaam's not shocked that the donkey talked to him. Like, he must have been in that much of a rage that it was just like, well, because you're not walking. Uh, and then he suddenly sees the angel and realises that there was certain death for him. Uh, but Balaam, what he did, he was seeking after payment. So he wasn't a godly man. You can read in the accounts, if you, if you read in Numbers twenty two twenty five. sometimes people get confused and they think he was like a godly man. Uh, but you can read plenty of times in the New Testament where they show his true nature. Uh, but Balaam, what he tr- truly sought after was to just get money and get money for praising or blessing uh, people and cursing people. And so uh, he was actually trying to be used by the, Moabite, uh, the Moab, the king of Moab, uh, to curse Israel. And he was like, yep, give me all your money and I can say whatever comes into my mouth from the Lord, uh, from God. And that was a key. He always said it, was, it wasn't him blessing. It was like, whatever words come into my mouth from God. Uh, and even though God warned him, and this it's quite interesting, it's a good read, but God warned him not to do, go with him and said, Oi, mate, like, I don't want you to do anything like with that. Uh, and he knew it was God and he ignored him, went on, and then, uh, yeah, Lord decided to judge him after he made him bless him three times. He had three goes at trying to curse Israel and ended up blessing them three times. But then there's a follow-on story where he, the last part where he actually showed uh, the king of Moab how to uh, defile Israel as well. But it's the greed of ba- uh, Balaam. So these, uh, these wicked men who have come into this congregation, they're, they're being led by their emotions purely. Uh, they're seeking after gain uh, and just for uh, a way to be able to uh, make their life better. And then it comes to the last part of verse 11. It says, And perished in the gainsaying of Kor, uh, and that core is Korah, uh, so K-O-R-A-H, if you're looking for uh, the Hebrew one. Uh, and it's, you can find this story in Numbers 16. And this is really when uh, they were sons of Levi, so they were, uh, they were priests uh, chosen to serve God. And they pretty much came up Korah. Uh, he led a rebellion against Moses and Aaron and said, Who are you uh, to be so special to serve, to rule over us? God didn't say that. You're just saying it so that you can make us a prince, like make yourself a prince. That's the whole reason we're walking around the wilderness, so you can feel important. Not because they didn't, you know, believe in God. Uh, So he raised a rebellion and uh, went against God's authority. uh, And it was, and it's it's a good story to read as well uh, to show how the Lord's going to deal with it. Uh, And you see the hearts, uh, the heart of the Lord, where He doesn't how quickly and how righteously he is ready to judge. Uh, From that rebellion where where Korah started to have the people murmur from it, there's actually a part where the Lord says to Moses and Aaron, I'll wipe this people out. You two come out of the camp, I'm going to wipe them out. And Moses actually like prays, uh, Moses and Aaron pray and say, Lord, please don't punish the whole congregation for these men that have done this sin. Uh, And obviously the Lord was going to save like... uh, went and punished those men and their families by opening up the earth and closing it uh, directly uh, again uh, and in a quick fashion, so much so that the people were so scared that they were running around thinking they were going to be swallowed up by the earth. So we have Cain who's led by emotions, Balaam who's after greed, and we have Korah who has no respect for authority and just wants to be the top dog himself. And so this is what is laying down the character of these men that have come in, that have snuck in and are preaching these falsehoods. Now in verse 12, it goes on to speak, uh, these are spots in your feast. So now he's describing what these men uh, do to the congregation. So they are spots or blemishes or stains in your feasts of charity. A feast of love would be something like uh, the Lord's Supper where the church would come through and they would share like a meal together. Uh, So what these uh, people would do, and as we read on, it says, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, with no regard, they're just, they're there to like satisfy themselves. They're not worried about the needs of anyone around them. Uh, Obviously not. We've done a study through uh, Wednesday on prayer meeting uh, on love and how that's meant to play out from a Christian point of view and how it's a sacrificial love. These men are not exhibiting any, uh, any of the traits that the Lord expects or that a changed heart from the Lord, uh, from the hope that's given in us, would have on someone. But they're feeding themselves without fear. He then goes on to describe them as clouds that are without water, carried about of winds. So it's quite an interesting, uh, quite an interesting picture when you think of clouds. Uh, they're, pretty, they're pretty useless if they're not bringing water. 
like for the most part. I know you can think of shade, but these are winds that are just being driven by the wind. They're just moving. They're wispy. They've got nothing to give, uh, but they're just there doing whatever they want. They're, there's no blessings coming out of them uh, that is going to fall on everyone around them. It describes these, uh, uses this description again in Proverbs 25, and I'll turn there for you, but uh, in Proverbs 25 and verse 14, it says, Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. So these men professing themselves to be, uh, to know God's will, to know what's, how God uh, expects you to live your life, are boasting themselves so much so that they are just like a cloud that has nothing to give. They're just empty. They're just something just floating up there that is never going to have an impact uh, down here uh, for things around them. But then we have another description of them is uh, trees whose uh, trees sorry not trees trees whose fruit withereth without fruit twice dead plucked up by the roots. Now the picture that they're painting here is a tree that is in autumn where its leaves have fallen off. There's no fruit on it, so it's that's the kind of tree. It's just the bare sticks and everything, and that tree is now plucked up out of the roots, and it's just lying on the ground. So it's not even as good as like a normal tree if it was in spring where it had leaves and fruit and everything and it had fallen over, you could go over and still pick the fruit that was on the tree. So these, these men that they're saying is they're so useless, they're even like a tree that has nothing to give even when it's ripped out. It's a double uh, fruitlessness uh, that they are producing in their life. He then talks about in verse 13, raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame uh, so they're just being driven about violently. Uh, they're not, uh, again, they're just living by their emotion. They're just living by uh, their instincts as a brute beast, as, a, as a, uh, a wild animal almost. And then it says, A wandering star to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. The wandering star, so if you want to think of a star that's uh, fixed in the sky like the Southern Cross and that, it has a purpose. It's fit. You can navigate off it. You can lead someone off it. You come to a wandering star, like a shooting star and stuff. Yeah, sweet. Looks pretty. Does nothing for navigation. Does nothing to guide someone. Uh, and so that's where that's leading in. As we come to uh, Enoch, uh, sorry, into verse 14, we start into uh, where Jude is quoting from uh, a book. He's quoting from the book of uh, Enoch, or at least a part of a little story. Um, <coughs> It says in verse 14, it says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, uh, and it, it could be from the book. It could also be Enoch, the book of Enoch was written after, but there's arguments for it. Uh, but it says here in verse 14, it says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these things, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all all, of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Uh, this, this law, the Lord bringing uh, saints with him and 10,000 saints to make judgment is not uh, unique to the book of Enoch. Uh, he's just, Jude's just decided to quote this because it just gets straight to the point uh, to uh, wind it up for uh, the people. Uh, that he's writing to but if you want to we can turn to Deuteronomy 33 verse 2 uh, and I, I might give a little bit on Enoch as well just so you're not you don't go off thinking the book of Enoch is scripture or should be in scripture either <laughs> uh, but Deuteronomy 33 and verse 2 it says and he said the Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them he shined forth from the Mount Paran and he came with ten thousands of saints from his right hand, went a fiery law for them. Uh, so the Lord's showing here that, again, he has those ten thousand uh, saints, the messengers, yep, at his right hand, ready uh, to serve him, ready to bring down uh, whatever judgment he needs. Uh, in Isaiah 66, in verse 15, it says, For behold, the Lord will come with fire, and with his chariots like a whirlwind, to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire, for by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the, sli uh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. So quite often, uh, God is a God of love, but he is a God of love that will pass judgment righteously. Uh, and so this is where uh, Jude, he's quoted this to say that God is coming with a certain judgment. Uh, he's given the examples, as we've already talked about, for that. 
Uh, and he's, he's sending out the warning to these, to these men, to the congregation for these men. Uh, in verse 16, it says, These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts. So now we get down to what these men are having the effect as well. So they're murmuring, they're causing divisions. Uh, they're just complainers in the church about everything. Uh, they're walking after their own lust. Their mouth speaketh great swelling words, trying to boast themselves up and flatter other people so that they can bring themselves up. Uh, they're, all they're worried about is having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. They're not trying to exhort or build up someone or help them through a hard time. They're purely doing it for their own advantage. Uh, and this is, the great, this is the, the great wickedness of this heart of these men. Uh, for the book of Enoch, I'll give you a quick one. Uh, yep, it's, uh, it was used in Jewish tradition. Uh, it wasn't part of, the, they didn't really recognize it as scripture. None of the early church did. Uh, and that's because uh, throughout it, it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, rife with Gnosticism as well. So it goes quite to the occult. Uh, but some of the main faults, if you want to go to them, you can go into, now I'm just stretching my memory. I think like uh, Enoch 58, around, around the 50 to 58, 59, uh, it'll talk about angels that uh, their responsibility is to intercede for sinners. Uh, that is not an angel's position. We know from scripture that it's Jesus who intercedes. Uh, they give accounts in the book of Enoch of when Noah was born that his he opened his eyes as a newborn and light shone out and lit up a room so much so that it freaked his dad out, Lamech, and he had to run off and go find Methuselah, his dad, to try and figure out what was happening because he thought he had a child that was not of this world kind of thing. So it's, uh, uh, it's quite rife with uh, heresy uh, in there. And it's, uh, yeah, so it's not scripture and, and there's plenty of other examples you can go through. Uh, and the whole premise of the book is pretty much it, it talks about angels and elevates angels and brings down Jesus. So the role that Jesus is doing through the book. So, uh, and that's where you just have to be careful of realising what uh, the book of Enoch is, is that it is just, mm, for want of a better word, I'd say like uh, almost a doctrine of the, uh, a watering down of doctrine to head into Gnosticism. So it'd be like uh, the doctrine of devils and stuff. So it's quite, yeah. That's it. You can do more study if you want to, <laughs> or you can talk to me later. Um, but yes, so uh, Jude here is not uh, saying that the book of Enoch is scripture, so I'm just pointing that out. Uh, just as Paul in previous uh, passages has uh, quoted different poets that have no good, uh, no good standing, uh, but he used it to derive a point uh, to the audience that he was talking to, and that's what Jude is doing here. It'd be the same as a preacher talking, like in Australia, about waltzing Matilda and, you know, wandering along and that it's yep there's someone stealing something so we talk about that or you could talk about well i can go like aboriginal side you talk like bunyip uh where they say it's a mix of anything but it's out to get you and you talk to that if you went to say the devil he can make himself anything and he's out to get you that doesn't make the story of the bunyip true but it's sh to show like that link for it almost an illustration anyway that's enough about that <laughs> how are we going for time all right uh so we have this wickedness in the verse uh, 1 to 16, but now we come to the last part, which is really where Jude is talking to the church to show them how to combat this. So not only to call out those uh, wicked men, but now to come to them uh, and how they are to uh, protect themselves within the church. So we come in verse, 14, uh, verse 17, sorry, it says, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. So Peter talked about this, Paul talked about this, Jesus talked about this in Matthew 7, uh, where he said, beware of false uh, teachers and false spirits. In 1 John it says, try the spirits. Uh, so these are men who have come here and they're where we worship in truth and in spirit and in love. Uh, he's saying, try them. Uh, obviously their life's not showing it, uh, but we know that there will be false teachers. In uh, verse 19, it says, These be they who separate themselves centrally or worldly or carnally, having not the spirit. Uh, so uh, they just put on a show and then try to justify themselves. In verse 20, it says, But ye beloved, so now he's talking to the congregation, build up yourselves. So he, he starts to liken them again to a building. So if you want to think of the temple, 
Uh, that's probably what he was aiming for. I can only uh, suppose that. But he puts it to a building where he says, on the foundation, what you need to build yourself up on is the most holy faith. So what they have on the foundation is their most holy faith that Jesus Christ came, he died on the cross, he was dead, he buried, and he rose again the third day. So that most holy faith, knowing that God has completed the work. Uh, and then it comes in into the next part where it says, uh, praying, so now we come to the next level, where it's praying in the Holy Ghost, where praying and having communication with God is so important, with praying on one side, keeping yourselves in the love of God, So we have these two things and we went through the scriptures in 1 Corinthians with the importance of love uh, and how that plays in a Christian's life and changes them uh, in an outward appearance of showing works. Uh, If you love me, keep my commandments. Uh, The Lord even said that and people will know that you love me by keeping my commandments. Uh, So we have praying and now we have keeping yourselves in the love and now we have like the roof that's what's going to keep them for the future and where it says, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ until eternal life. So he's given them what they're looking up towards, what they're striving for, which is the mercy that Jesus is coming again. And now for the last part where he's talked about building themselves, we now come to the part where he's still instructing them on what they need to do, which is to save the people that are in this world, uh, to be a witness for them. It says uh, in verse 22, And of some have compassion, making a difference. Of others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, having even the garments spotted or stained by the flesh. Uh, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Amen being this is true. So we have that the uh, Judas told them how to build themselves up. Very simple. Have your faith as your foundation. Pray. Stay in the love and look towards the hope that God has for you. And then the purpose that you have as you've built yourself is now to go out into the world to save others from an eternity in hell. To whether you're telling them the truth, to grip them out with fear where they've suddenly realised where their position is or maybe even just saving someone from the fact of uh, going into sinful life. And then he finishes with that doxology, which is so well uh, written, and Paul does it as well, where he says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, don't rely on yourself, and to present you faultless, so it's not our ability to wipe our own sins away, it's Jesus Christ who's done the work, before uh, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only, the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and authority, and power both now and forever. And so that's, uh, that's the book of Jude, and we did it. I'm sorry if that went just a little bit over time, but we did the, the book of Jude, and you can see how uh, it's quite a short book, but it's quite powerful in its uh, application for Christians, where we can have people and have teachings come in that are against God's word. But be on the lookout for it, and make sure that you're building yourself up and being strong in your walk with the Lord in faith, in praying, in staying in love and in looking for the mercy of the Lord. So let's just close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. We thank you for the words that you inspired uh, Jude to write, Lord, uh, that you've had here recorded for us uh, to give us uh, a warning, uh, but also a preparation, Lord, uh, for uh, what we should be on the lookout for, uh, to what we need to uh, be doing in our lives, Lord, with reaching out for the lost, Uh, to save people from an eternity in hell, uh, but, Lord, to make sure that we're staying close to you and teaching and following you in truth. We just lay this before you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we've got our last hymn to close, which is going to be 404. Uh, And 404 is, Let the Lower Lights Be Burning. Uh, It's only a short song, but with Let the Lower Lights Be Burning, it actually was... uh, brought on by uh, when D.L. Moody was teaching a lesson, oh sorry, preaching, uh, and it was about a a ship that had been shipwrecked when the lighthouse had gone out. 